Hello, my man. <laughs> Hello, my brother. This is How it's one of, those, one of those moments. It's one of those moments. Uh oh, we got you froze. Good. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a horrible start, man. <laughs> We're off to a typical, typical trajectory here. How you doing? I'm I'm incredible, man. Um, so we finished reading last night. And uh, the first thing I saw this morning was Chad's, like his, um, just his statement on Twitter about what he thought. And I left a review already um, on Amazon. I don't know if, it, if, I don't know if it's come through yet or not. I didn't see it. I didn't look. Okay. But uh, man, he nailed it with the one word raw. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, man. I, I, I warned you, my brother. I no. warned you. Man, like wow. speechless, man, did you, speechless. Did you read it together? We did. And, um, and I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did. Because I don't think she, my wife has fully, I don't know if, if, if accepted her life the way it is right now or if she, or if she's still longing you know and i'm waiting to see if that has been drawn out you know with your story it's interesting you say that i don't know if you noticed on twitter that someone named granny who engages with I Chad saw it. Off, often did you see her her comment i did i did what did you think about it oh i i totally totally understand okay uh, her, her her reflection was, I think, some scabs are better left, I guess, un, untouched or something. Yeah. And, you know, that's a great analogy, isn't it? Or a great metaphor. That's a great way of looking at, um, you know, we've all got scars, we've all got scabs, we've all got pains that we've gone through. Yeah. So I think a book like mine is, you'll know if you're ready, but you won't know if you're ready unless you try it. Yeah. yeah. And, and we came close. Um, we came very close to finding her dad. In fact, I think we had it narrowed down to a couple of people. And when we got ready to take the next step, she, she, you know, she pumped the brakes and I'm like, okay, you know, that's fine. Um, so I'm just wondering, and we had yet to really decompress because there's a lot in your book because it affected me on two levels, right? It affected me as a police officer because I helped, I helped young Kevin, young Kevin. I helped a lot on the street and young Kevin was very frustrating to help because young Kevin didn't want help. Young Kevin wanted to do the things young Kevin wanted to do. And it was so frustrating for me because I'm willing to give all of myself to say, Hey, there's, there's options. There's quality this way. And and just when someone's not willing or ready to accept that yet, you know, as an officer, you're like, man, what, what am I doing here? You know, my job is to try to help my community and I'm pouring everything I can into this person and I get pushback. And I dealt with so many people that you described as yourself, you know, on the streets or in homes. So that's, it was affecting me one way, but then watching how it was affecting us personally as well, opened up a whole nother conversation so i am totally indebted to you for for being courageous you know um being vulnerable was just your gift to the world and and i thank you for that because it was amazing amazing what you did well thank you and i appreciate that and you recognize as well as i do that there was a lot of intervention a lot of help that I finally was able to receive. My wife's a social worker, and I know that, that she has those same kind of frustrations you're speaking of. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and I just see it seems like it's getting nowhere sometimes. And she's never read my book, and most likely never will. But she knows um, the, she, but she knows the book because right. she knows me. She knows all the details. And one of the things that she recognizes over and over again is, you don't know. You may not think that you've made an made an impact on somebody. But it could be 20 years from now and something you did on the street to that with that little Kevin, something you said, some effort that you put in there, even if it was just this frustrated Kevin, listen to me. You know, I've been here for days and days trying to talk to you and you're not hearing me. It's not what you're saying. It's how you're saying it. It's not that you're offering perfect advice to me. It's that you care enough to offer advice. It's not that you're showing up with all the answers to my prayers and all my problems are going to be solved. 
It's that you're showing up at all. It's the fact that you show up with empathy and compassion that stuck with me. And maybe we could look at it now through reading the book. You could tell me, why do you think someone like little Kevin and then big Kevin for a while, right? There was a lot of years when I got older. Why wasn't I able? What was standing in my way now that you've read the book? What do you think? I think you were standing in the way of yourself. Tell um, me. You know, well, because a lot of times, and I see that with myself, you know, I, I get in the way of myself from progressing whether it's out of fear or anxiety or the unknown, I'm not willing to take that next step because I don't know where it's going to lead to. And for somebody like me, me, I need a lot of certainty of where I'm going to be going. So a lot of times I get in the way of myself. And I think reading the book, I saw that with you a little bit. I saw that you, you had the potential, you had moments of success, but then when you started, I think almost at one point, you were almost scared of success because you didn't know what it looked like. And I'm not sure if I'm describing that right. But I mean, I'm just trying to relate that to my experiences of people that I've helped in the past, where they will do so good. Um, one, one gentleman in particular, you know, would, would stay sober for six months, and we would start to see this amazing progress. And then out of nowhere, you just fall off and, and get uh, completely intoxicated. And we'd have to start all over. And I would ask him, you know, what, what happened? You're so close. I mean, we saw so much progress. And he told me I was never close. It may have looked like it. It may have felt like it to y'all. I was never close. Yeah, I could stay sober for a while. And I was like, and I, and I just, I can't put my mind into it because I'm not him, right? I've never been in that situation. And I know, I, I know we have success stories, right? Because I would be contacted by people to say, hey, I want you to come to my my graduation from AA. I want you to uh, come and meet my family now. We're reunited. But for for a helper, for somebody in a helper profession, for me, it's the ones that um, that you can't reach. You know, I, I remember an 18 year old girl I was trying to help, and she told me, "Look, I would rather be dead than accept your help." And those hurt, and it, and I just it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it but I can't place myself there because I've never been there. So, you know, part of that was, man, there's little Kevin, here's somebody trying to reach out and he just won't take it, you know? And, and what's, what's strange about that is you had a support system. Some of the people I help have a good support system, but just aren't able or willing, right. To take advantage of those. There are pieces that you've, you've known about me because not only have you read the book, but before you read the book, we got to know each other and uh, full disclosure, we've had some nice chats walking the dog and things like that. So and we, we kind of go way back, right? And uh, so there's been pieces of me that you've known through the videos, right? Through our chats personally. And I think when someone reads the book, they're shocked. They're dismayed. They can't believe it's the same person that they know. Right, because even if you've watched those videos, even if you've had that conversation with me, and I've been honest, the book kind of gives you the granularity. It, it, it kind of puts colors and fills in all those those nuances. Did you find that that gave you a different way of not only looking at me but thinking about other people that you may only have pieces of their puzzle, not the full picture? Well, so because I because I was in law enforcement for so long, I always I never had the full picture. Because anytime I showed up, I had a snapshot, right, of what was going on within the moment. But I knew what, what was in the moment wasn't the truth, right? It was just a snapshot. So I've always tried to prepare my mind to think, okay, I'm dealing with a situation that just didn't happen. That This goes, trauma is going to be involved somewhere along the way. And if I can make a connection with this individual and not focus on correcting the problem, right? And not focus on the problem, but focus on the person. Maybe if I make that connection, we can backtrack a little bit and find that trauma and say, hey, let's start here instead of what we're looking at today and move towards today so we can find out what happens next time, right? How do we, how do we get past this? What kind of coping skills, what kind of uh, support system do you need in place, you know, so we can really help you. And you know, I love teaching. When I was teaching to police officers, I taught a class called Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it's all about just trauma as a child and how that can affect your life growing up, both physically and mentally. And I love teaching the class to police officers because 
a lot of them have had their own trauma that they've never dealt with. So I think if they can better understand who they are and what they've been through, maybe they will be able to understand why they relate to certain situations the way they do and have better outcomes in the community. So you're right. It, it definitely filled in the blanks and in, in the, um, in the parts of the drawing that weren't colored in after I read it, but I wasn't shocked and I wasn't surprised because I've, I've been doing this for so long. And, but my heart broke at the same time. My heart broke because I saw a support system for you. I saw moments of success followed by setback after setback. So, you know, all in all, it was just an emotional roller coaster to read that. Most people will will have less of a, a history, you know, because they don't work in the field that you work in. And they just haven't met a lot of people like me. And even if they have, they haven't heard the story. I find that for me, I meet people and I've told this story before and it'll be winter time like this, or, you know, to be cooler weather. I'll have on my long sleeve shirt, you know, they won't notice. And uh, all of a sudden spring or summertime comes, you know, and I'll take off my shirt, come, you know, come and talk to them. And they, they won't be noticing too much because, you know, maybe there's, you know, a long sleeve t-shirt. And then they'll see me reach out like this to pick something up and they'll go, Kevin? And I'll be, yeah. I'll say, you have a tattoo? <laughs> and I'll say, oh, yeah. And they'll say, what, you have a tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll do one of those. Sometimes they're like, can I see it? And I'll, yeah, there it is. And can I touch it? People want to know more about it. Yeah. But eventually what really comes from that is they can't believe that the me that they've perceived, the, the guy that they see every day, maybe work with, maybe see in the shopping you know, center, maybe they just see me on a board, you know, a meeting that we're in, a committee that we're doing. They can't believe that the person that they've perceived has a tattoo. And of course I have fun with that. And I say, oh no, I have three. And like, you have three. And I say, oh yeah, I've got, you know, one on this side, one on each shoulder. What is it? And I said, well, it's two dragon heads. What? And I said, yeah. And I've got the full dragon and it wraps down around my leg and a tail comes out of my ankle. And they said, really? And I said, no, I have a bird and a butterfly. It's a hummingbird. Uh, you don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Now, you know that dear Stephen Michael mother, which is right there behind me, you know, has this beautiful picture of these two women and this picture of this little baby. And then you open up the book and you, you just page back, page, page after page after page, you know, you could kind of keep looking at the cover and look at the, 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 the words inside and say, I, I didn't expect this. Yeah. What did you learn about, um, and again, we're going back to some folks that you know in your life, what did you learn about maybe people in your life or maybe experiences you've had and that real understanding that I had to grapple with about who I was in relation to where I came from? Because like you said, I had a lovely family. My dad's gone now. My adoptive father died 10 years ago, but my 92-year-old mother is literally sitting right above me right now. Say hi, mom. Right. And I told her, I said, be quiet. I'm, I'm doing a, doing an interview down here and down in the studio. She said, okay, I'll be quiet. You know, I'll, I'll turn the TV down low. But I was also missing something, wasn't I? And there was a big part of my journey that you just read about, which wasn't just all about the drugs and the alcohol and the abuse and the Kevin that you wish you could help. It was about an adult Kevin searching for something that was very lost. How did that affect you? Well, you know, I think, aren't we all searching for something at some point in our lives? You know, uh, for me, uh, I know it was maturity. It was understanding of who I was and really what my purpose was in life. And that just took me time to get to. I think for you, you, you had uh, you had it like t twice as heavy because you're still trying to recreate the new you through sobriety and find out who you really are. And at the same time, be in search of something that has eluded you for so long. And I can't imagine, you know, just the, the stress that, that, that you were going through at the time that you were on this journey. But then uh, just the adulation, just the happiness that must have occurred the moment that you met your family. So, you know, for me, the, the, people, I, the people I work with, you know, because I deal specifically with people that have mental health diagnoses, and they don't know who they truly are because maybe they haven't taken advantage of treatment that's available. And when they do, uh, do finally accept that treatment, things are a little bit more clearer. They have a little bit more focus. Oh, 
okay, this makes better sense to me now. You know, so sometimes it takes it takes time, you know, to find out who you are, uh, where you're going in life. And, you know, I've, I've understood this, you know, when dealing with people, you have to be patient. You have to be patient because you're on their time and it's their issue that they're dealing with, right? And all we are is a mechanism or a vessel that's been placed there to help them maybe get to the next next spot. And that's all I've ever looked at my career as, is I'm, I'm just a vessel to help you if I can, if I can get you to the other side. And if I can't, maybe I can find somebody that can. So I think patience is one thing that I really learned um, in dealing with people that are always in search of the next thing. And the patience also, and it's interesting because we were talking about it earlier, it starts to reflect back on patience with your own self, patience with your own growth. One of the things you always and I always talk about is empathy and compassion. And if you start with a sense of self-empathy, understanding that there's going to be limitations to not only what you can do to help others, how, limitations on how much you, you are ever going to succeed in life, even at similar things to what I've been going through. Many people will look at recovering from addiction and they will have certain degrees of growth. As I say, sometimes we feel like we're quantum leaping and other times we feel like we're barely dragging our feet through the mud. But it's that little inch by inch with self-compassion and understanding that, well, this is the best that I can do today. And maybe tomorrow I'll do a little more. Maybe I'll even fall back 10 steps, but then I'll get back up again and I'll move forward. One of the keys, and I'm going to ask you, but it's really more of a rhetorical question because I know what you're going to say is the real key for me, and I think it has been for you personally, is to understand I can't do this alone. I can't help other people alone. I can't recover alone. And when I look at other folks who are struggling, usually what I see, and I'm asking this, do you see that people are just trying to do it on their own? They're trying to do it their way, but they're also just trying to do it without anyone else. Yeah, and I think that happens for a few reasons, right? One is maybe they just don't know any better. Maybe they don't have, you know, that support system in place to help guide them uh, to where they need to go. Uh, sometimes people just, they just don't want the help. Uh, they're very content in the way that they're living because that's all they know. And they're, you know, I don't know if the word afraid or apprehensive to get outside of that comfort zone or their bubble that they're in, but that will inhibit a lot of growth. For an individual that has a lot of potential because they're just not willing to take that next step out of fear. Um, you know, uh, then there's the other side of it. There's those that have no support system at all. And, you know, unfortunately, those are the ones that I've seen, uh, you know, when we get to the call, sometimes it's too late. You know, a lot, you know, sometimes a suicide has happened. And it's tough to deal with those because, you know, as, as, as a helper, you're like, man, you had my number. All you had to do was call. All you had to do was reach out. What you know, police officers, you know, that I've dealt, that I've gone to their funerals that have committed suicide, that I knew personally, that I worked with, that knew me. Why couldn't you have just called? Why couldn't you have just reached out? And and I think that's a protective factor for yourself by by kind of putting it on back on the person. Like this was you. Why didn't you do this? When a lot of times it's did we miss something? Did we miss a red flag? Like you said, do you walk past that person on a park bench and then stop and then walk back and say, are you okay? You look a little sad today. You know, are we doing that as a society, as a community? And your book really brought that out and, and really made me think. And it's those examples there that I think are gonna touch people and, and make the communities that they live in a better place. Is there a part of you that recognizes that that's not just hard to do for some people to ask others. Uh, it's not just hard to do because it feels like an imposition, but it's hard, also hard to do because that language is so ostracizing and so full of stigma. And really, in, in general, it, it's we don't want to demystify suicide, but destigmatizing, taking that stigma down. So I can say to you, more than just saying, are you having a bad day? So I can say directly to that person, are you having suicidal thoughts? Are you having thoughts of self-harm? And saying it in a way that doesn't make me cringe to say it. These are difficult conversations. You and I have mentioned the word suicide several times now. And one of the things I should take a moment and probably have to put it on the video is for a trigger warning for folks. 
because anyone that's listening to this right now, if you're struggling and if this is this is giving you a little bit of, you know, heart palpitations, you can feel your anxiety rising, maybe click the pause button, please, and take a minute before you come back to this. And I will definitely put the 800 number down in the description below. If you're having any suicidal thoughts, please call the 800 number. Do you think that's a part of that, though, is that we feel not just the awkwardness to it, but this sense of there's a stigma related to having these conversations that makes them almost impossible to have with strangers, much less even the people that we know. Yeah, 100% yes. And the reason I'll say that is, you know, and I'll speak from a law enforcement perspective, you know, last year we had 239 officers commit suicide and 45 died in the line of duty by violent, by, by, by violent means. So it's an epidemic in law enforcement that suicide that we're killing ourselves at a rate of four to one from dying in the line of duty. And why is that? Because what you just said, stigma. So how do we get past stigma? We do exactly what you and I are doing right now, and we talk about it. If I said, hey, Kevin, are you busy Tuesday night? I don't want to go bowling. And you say, well, I'd like to, but I need to see my therapist tonight. That should not shock my conscience. I should say, okay, well, maybe next week we'll go. Instead of saying, hey, did you know Kevin's seen a therapist? What's wrong with him? Right? That's where this stigma comes from. And I think if we normalize it, by having the conversations like you and I are having right now, it, we can slowly chip away at that stigma and let people know that it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way, right? It's really interesting how we look at mental health as so different from physical health, isn't it? And mental wellness as different from physical wellness. And we see children sick. We see children that have lost their legs. We see children that have, you know, had had, you know, uh, harm done to them in different ways. And if it's physical, our hearts go out to them morning, noon and night. And we want to talk about it. And we have language around that doctors, professionals, everyone has language around this. But if we see a little kid that's struggling in school and we're wonder, we're more likely than to judge them than we are to have some sort of empathy for them. When we see young children, teenagers, as you were saying, that aren't able, for some reason, aren't able to accept our help, aren't able to get it together, aren't able to stop getting high, stop walking the streets, stop stealing. They're, they're behaving in ways that seem irrational to us. And yet when we come at it, it's not with a sense of, well, something's wrong here. Something's wrong here, right? That, you know, if it's a physical manifestation that I can see, or even something that I could say, "Are you okay?" and they say, "No, no, I've got you know really stomach pains." We can't see the stomach pains, but instantly we say, "Oh gosh, you better see it." Oh, I hope you feel better. There's an right. empathy that comes immediate. But if I were to say to a young 13-year-old, well, "What's going on with you?" Well, I don't know. What the hell you want from me, right? That language isn't clear to me, but I can tell something's wrong there. Something's different there, and I need to be able to be educated enough to ask the right questions rather than saying you know why don't you get your act together why don't you pull yourself up by your bootstraps why don't i need to ask the right questions well have you been have you been having headaches lately have you been feeling a little bit more kind of you know confused have your thoughts been uh, maybe a little bit scattered i can start looking for those clues that allow me to understand that there's probably some emotional or some mental uh, illness or mental disability that's happening and then I can approach that from a totally different angle. Yeah, and I love what you say because it comes down to the word education, right? So when, you know, I'm glad that we're seeing this shift in law enforcement where they're starting to put mental health training at the forefront. You know, you're seeing co-responders units put together, but what I, what I teach them and what I say, and I think it goes back to the point you just made perfectly was when a paramedic gets called to a scene, you know, they always have gloves on because there's an assumption that there could be a communicable disease involved, right? So they're prepared to deal with that. What I tell the officers is, I need you to kind of glove up your mind and understand that there may be a traumatic event that has taken place in this person's life that has now caused this crisis to happen. And if you don't know how to communicate and how to respond and connect to that person and get the rapport you need to be able to break through and help them, you may show up and do more a disvalue, right? You may cause more of a problem by getting there and not knowing how to communicate, even though your intentions are good to try to help this person. But if you're not educated and you don't know what to ask, like you said, scattered thoughts, racing thoughts, 
You know, are you sleeping well at night? Are you having nightmares? There's so many different ways to assess an individual, but they just don't know because the training is so decentralized in law enforcement. So, you know, I think as a community member, we take law enforcement out of it. I think every community member ought to take the eight hour mental health uh, course, mental health first aid. You know, it really gives you an understanding and a basis of what mental health looks like, how it can present itself and really clear up a lot of misconceptions that people have about mental health. And in doing so, again, going back to stigma, we can start breaking down some of the stigma involved with people's mental health. I know that as you're transitioning into your new role with the uh, the DOD, I believe, uh, yeah. there's going to be a lot that will transfer over, including the experiences you've had and the knowledge you have of the institution. What have you seen that uh, that does tie in? And maybe what have you really started to notice that's different? Well, so right now, for those that don't know, I've taken a position with the Department of Defense and for the Navy. And my job right now is as an instructor for the Navy's C School Master of Arms program, right? Which is their version of the military police. And I have a very short amount of time, six weeks, to teach uh, these Master of Arms that just finished a, a basic A school, uh, which didn't have much training, as they transition out into this specialty school about how to be a police officer in six weeks. And what I've noticed, because I've taught at the police cadet level, and now I'm teaching in the military at basically their recruit level, uh, some have returned from fleet, but majority are very young, is that the difference between somebody being 18 in the military and somebody being 21 in a police academy is not real different. It's really not uh, because, you know, the, the, the brain for a male doesn't even stop developing or start stop developing until you're about 25, 26, yet we're gonna empower them, right, with all this authority. And so that maturity level, is it, there's not a big difference there, but what I have seen, what I what I what I have recognized is behaviors are behaviors, right? People are people, and if you understand, you know that everybody that that you're going to touch, they have their own unique fingerprint, right? They're all different in their own way, and they all need to be maybe taught at a different level, uh, spoken to at a different level. What's difficult is in the military, it's this way or no way, right? It's the Navy way. We're going to do it the Navy way. We're in the police academy, you know, we had a little bit more uh, leeway in what we needed to do to try to teach tactics, right? But uh, the military says, hey, you're going to do it this way and not deviate. Over here, it's like, well, this is one way of doing it, but there's also some other different ways, right? So I've seen that, you know, in the crossover. And I love the opportunity uh, to speak to the Navy about preparing them for their new roles. But what I've seen is I have not seen yet the block for mental health and resiliency. So I'm trying to put that together. I'd like to send that uh, up to Virginia and see if we can't get that included for a couple of extra days of training to try to prepare them for what they may encounter. You know, because I mean, are, these are young kids going all over the world. Are there stigmas that are, do you see the stigma uh, that we've been talking about uh, somewhat mirrored in both of those environments in the police and uh, the law enforcement and also in the military? Yeah, I would say they're almost identical because you're attracting a group of people that want to be helpers, right? And they want to be in a profession of helpers. So what can your helper not need? Your helper cannot need help themselves, right? Or else they're no good to anybody. So that's where they put up this facade or they put on this mask that I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be the one that's going to come and help you. Yet at the end of the day, you know, you're going to need to do some self-care yourself. And it took me a long time to realize that, you know, I was in law enforcement 28 years and I did not understand the importance of self-care. And I paid a toll for that. My family paid a toll for that over the years, you know, not knowing why I just broke down crying, uh, not understanding why all of a sudden I don't want to talk at night one night, you know, it's because I wasn't preparing myself uh, to take care of myself. And I think you see the same thing in the military and in police academies is, they're told you cannot be weak. You have to be strong. You're that line of defense, right? When we need you out there. But if they're not well and they're not taking care of themselves, how good is the military or the community that we're trying to serve going to benefit from some of it? You just used the magic word to me as community. And it's we are all a part of that community. If we're if we're in law enforcement, we are not in a law enforcement community. We are a law enforcement that's in 
a community. We are all part of the community. Same thing with the military. It is its own world, so to speak. It is its own community, its own family. I was in the Navy, so you know from the book, I've had some one-on-one -on -one experiences with that. And what a wonderful organization, what a very strong support system it could have been to me. And you know from reading my book that I rejected that. I was not able at that point to really take the help that they were offering me. And yet they are part of a community and they come from communities. So a lot of folks that are in the law enforcement, my assumption has always been that a lot of them come from maybe their local communities to serve in a local community. But a military person is coming from anywhere in the United States to serve anywhere in the world. And they are mixing and matching. Now we have something in education and I work in education uh, called prior knowledge. So prior information. So you come to any circumstance with an understanding of whatever the world was before you came there. And if you're coming from one state or another state, you're going to see certain behaviors differently. If you come from one family, if you come from one educational background. And what there's a great book called um, uh, Cowfish. And it talks about these two fish and one of them goes up on land, sees a cow, comes back and tries to tell the other fish about, about a cow. He says, you know, and it's got an udder and it's got this and it's got, and, the fish that's never been up on land sees all these things, sees the udder, sees all these things with with scales <laughs> and with, with fins, right? Because it only knows a fish. So I think a lot of what I see is your challenge in law enforcement, but even more so with the DOD and with the Navy specifically where you're working, is you've got people coming from everywhere with a whole bunch of understandings, prior knowledge of what a cow looks like but it's based on the fact that they've been a fish for a long time. How do you deal with getting people's perception so they can, I don't wanna use the word relearn, but re, maybe reacclimate or start to acclimate to a different way of looking at things? Yeah, well, I, you know, that, that's just part of maturity, right? And that's part of traveling and seeing the world. A lot of that's gonna be kind of on the job training, learning the different cultures where you end up, uh, learning the different, I mean, you're going to learn everything different from the types of foods to the types of families, what's taboo, what's not taboo. And that's not something that I think can be taught at the level of what they're going through at this point. A lot of it, I think, is going to be life experience, which I think is huge because learned in life experience is what's going to build them up to find the person that they are trying to find. Right. And I, and, and I say that because I saw that in you and I saw that in your book. It just seemed like you were just continuing this search. And I thought maybe when you got in the Navy, I'm like, he's going to find it. You know, there's going to be structure and there's going to be authority and he's going to have to fall in line. No, he was still little Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, uh, I did. I did find I found the first bar. I found the first <laughs> beer. I found I always was looking for I was looking for something, wasn't I? I was looking for something that was going to allow my life to be better, to be more fruitful, to be more, more acclimated to kind of like me feeling like I was human and I belonged. And that was really what it was. But every time I looked, the, the, I guess it was the low hanging fruit, maybe we would say, the place that I acclimated the most quickly was to the alcohol, was to the drugs. And that, that took a lot of, I had to hit a lot of bottoms before I was able to take that extra step as it would walk past that beer walk past that joint walk, walk past that line of cocaine and maybe walk to to a meeting to a 12-step group to a therapist to be with other people sitting in a denny's where we could have this kind of conversation which this kind of conversation was impossible you know after reading my book i couldn't even put two sentences together in the end yeah. And, you know, in people dealing in, in the military, because I do have a few people coming back from fleet that have been in for a few years and talking to them, you know, I hear them say, well, I'm going to get out. You know, I'm just going to do my four and get out. Some of them I'm going to re-up. Um, you know, everybody has these different ideas of what success for them looks like. You know, for those that want to re-up, I ask them, why? Why do you want to re-up? I like the structure. I like the stability. You know, I don't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow because it's already planned out for me. OK, you like that kind of structure. And then I ask somebody else, well, why are you getting out? Really, I only joined because I needed a job and now I have some skill. I want to go out into the world. You know, so it's the diversity of what you see in the military is different to me than what you see in the police academy, because those that join the police academy, they're there. 
their, their mindset is I'm going to do 30 years, 25 years, whatever it takes. And then I'm going to get out and retire. And then who knows, right? But that's their mindset. We're in the military. It's, I don't know yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, some of them go to school at night, you know, they want to do well and promote and, and, and others are like, I don't care. You know, I'll just do whatever they tell me to do. And what happens happens. So it's, it's different. You know, you see a diversity of people. You know, you've, you're one of those guys. You did your 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 tour, so to speak. Yeah. You are retired and moving into a different realm. Let's shift for a minute past what success means. What is, forget about work for a minute. What does happiness mean for Ernie right now? What's happiness look like? Happiness to me right now, um, wow. It's, I, I right now I feel fulfilled, right? I feel fulfilled with my family. I feel content in my faith. I feel happy. I don't feel stress or anxiety anymore. And I think that's partly because I retired, right? <laughs> from law firm. But for me, happiness is just having that sense of family and love and closeness. And then of course, my relationship with the Lord. Um, I, I'm really good at, at blocking out outside factors and protecting what's close here at home. And to me, that's, that's where I find happiness. When I have to leave and do something, not so much. I, this okay. is my comfort space. This is where I feel the most safe. And not everyone, and this is the reason I asked, because th those are wonderful pieces of a puzzle. Not everyone can be where you are. Not everyone can have the retirement, for one thing. Not everyone can have a family that they feel safe and, and secure with. Not everyone has those that's, that sense of belonging. And not everyone really has the, say, overall uh, education, you said, like you has learned the things that you've learned. There's a course that Yale did in 2018, and it was one of the most, it was the, their most popular course. And it was done one time in person, but it's been done virtually since. And during the pandemic, it went from like maybe thousands of people to 3.3 million people have now taken the course. And it's called the happiness course. It's not the happiness project, which is another book. It's the happiness course. Now, without going into the long, long details of it, it's really focusing on students, of course, but it's for anyone. Okay, eat right, sleep right, self-care. But the third piece that I found most eye-opening was do something for someone else. Talk to me about that for you. I, I love it because on the back of my clipboard that I carried for years, there was a sticker that said others. And it was a reminder for me on a men's conference that I went to years ago. And the topic was exactly what you said, do for others, serve others before you serve yourself. That, Kevin, right there is happiness as well. Giving yourself, giving of yourself, you know, as a servant to others uh, is a sense of happiness. And I'm glad you brought that up. I have no idea how that would have escaped my mind because that bumper sticker stayed on my clipboard and is still there today for probably over 25 years now. And um, I love that. And I love your, your slogan about serving, right? And, and, and others. And yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I don't think it. it's, I don't think it slipped your mind at all. I think that, <laughs> I think that it's on the back of that clipboard for 20 some odd years. Um, and as you know, there's that old, I guess maybe it's a poem or an adage, I forget where it comes from, but you know, uh, what is it? Reap and sow, reap and sow. So, you know, so as you sow, so shall you reap. So, you know, sow a habit, right? Reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. I, I can't remember the exact words, but it, I don't think it's slipping your mind at all. It's intuitive for you now. Your whole world is about service. Your, the reason you came here today, I know, is the same reason I asked you to come here today, to be of service. You and I both know more than anything, this isn't even about us right now. And <laughs> I will say it bluntly because I want to be clear, we're not the only two here right now, are we? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? And, and I'm not talking about the fact that this is being viewed by someone on YouTube. That's the real thing that is, to me, the miracle of it. We, by the time this, you're, whoever's watching this or listening to this right now, uh, by this time, we've let go of this, but we trust that whatever we're doing here, whatever we're saying here, it's not about us. It's about understanding that we don't have, we don't have to worry about where this is going to go and how this is gonna help other people. We know, we know exactly what's gonna happen with this. It's going to be taken by, our higher power, I'll use that generic phrase if you don't mind, 
taken by our higher power and used to serve and help others. And that's the whole reason I show up on any given day. Yeah, and, and I encourage your, your viewers, if you have not yet viewed your Christmas message, to go back to your YouTube channel and view that Christmas message and listen to your reading. Because at the end, you say it is about us. And that truly, in essence, is why we are having this conversation, because it's truly about us as a people, as a society. It's about it's about that that community, and that's a very different community because we have the we have the obvious community of our neighbors and friends. We have the community at large for our country and our world, and we think of that. But to me, we have the physical, the mental, the emotional. But we do have a spiritual community, and when we pay attention to that in whatever way that means to different people, I understand it's different for others. And you know, a friend of ours and I just chatted yesterday for a while, and we have very different understandings of what it means and what it should mean and what it can mean. And it doesn't mean any, it doesn't matter at all to me. It matters that we're here right now and I trust that part of the process. So I'm not trying to be vague and I know, I know you're not either, but we've talked about some very serious things here. And I want to leave us on that positive note, which is we're not here just to dredge up the past. There's someone named Granny. Hi, Granny. If you're listening right now, there's someone named Granny that made a comment, and it was a wonderful one about my book, which is great, saying, I don't know if that'd be a good scab to pick, right, to scratch it. Some scabs are better left alone. And I can completely understand that that's wherever we are in this process, whether we feel like we're being wounded the wounds are there, the scabs are healing, or our scars are there and we're not sure what to do with them. Wherever we are in this moment, in this process, it's fine where we are. Let's just take that next step. Let's take it together. Tell me a little bit about how you would, what would be a closing message for this entire conversation that you would want to make sure people, people came away at the end of this and realized I'm not alone. I don't have to do this alone. And I really want to take the next step. I'm just not sure what to do. And you don't have to be sure what to do. And that's why there's help available, right? There's help available to guide you, uh, to help you refocus, to help you self-center yourself, uh, maybe to give you the options you need. You know, one of my favorite quotes of all time is vulnerability is our most accurate measurement of courage. So as a human, if you will become vulnerable, that will show immense courage in your life. And I do believe you will get to where you're trying to get to. And it may be a struggle. It may not be easy. Uh, you may have to crawl. You may have to scratch. You may have to cry. And that's okay. Uh, just don't give up. Don't give up because life, life will punch you in the face. And, um, and all I can say to you is that you, know, you are loved. There are people that love you. There are people that are available to you. And just show that strength and courage to continue on. I love the word courage and I appreciate it so much. There's a saying, and you know, I'm in the 12 step groups and I've heard this, maybe not just in the 12 step groups, but when you're afraid, they say fear is a lack of faith. And I stop there. I stop there and I say, wait a minute, I'm afraid almost every day. And I have what I would consider maybe a mustard seed, but a mustard seed is profound faith for me. It's profound for me. I, I didn't think I was capable of even that, but wait a minute, if I can, have faith and I'm still afraid often, then what's the difference? And you said it, it's courage. Yeah. It's courage. So acting in the face of that fear with faith that I will be guided. Yeah. Tim Keller was my uh, the pastor that baptized me at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. And I often would hear him preach about different things. And one of them was about making a decision. How do you do? I don't know what to do. And a lot of times we're not trying to make a decision to get away from something bad. Sometimes it's good. Do I take this job or do I take this job? For you, it would be, do I retire and, you know, and go to the DOD or I do another, do another five years? And then he would say, people would come to me and say, you know, I don't know whether to do this or this. And we'd go through it. You know, have you prayed about it? Did you talk to your family about it? Did you take it to your, your group, you know, your, your home fellowship group? Did you do all these things? Yes, and I can't make a decision. And Tim would look at them and he would say, pick one. <laughs> and they'd say, what? And he'd say, pick one. He's like, but I don't, I don't know which one God wants me to do. And he'd say, well, you, you, you don't. He said, the person would say, what do you mean? It's like a 50-50 crapshoot? He's like, yes. You have a 50-50 chance of being right, but you have a 100% chance of being guided once you make the decision. So if anyone here is struggling and afraid, recognize that there is two guys chatting with each other right now, both of us have fear. 
two guys chatting with each other, both of us have faith. Two guys chatting each other. And the only difference between us moving forward and not moving forward individually and as friends and in a community is that we just take that step together, recognizing that we will be guided. And that's what courage represents to me. Not trusting in only myself, but trusting that I will be guided once I make these decisions. You think I wanted to do this video today? <laughs> you think I wanted to show up? Of course I did. It's fun to talk to you. It's great to do these kind of things, but I don't know if this is what God wants me to do. I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life, but I'm going to do it and trust that I'll be guided when I'm done. This is, uh, I, I want you to tell people where they can get a hold of you and how they can uh, find you. Wow. Okay. Well, I am on Twitter. Uh, e Stevens 0845 is my Twitter handle. Um, and if you haven't seen the documentary, the HBO documentary, you can look over my shoulder and it's called Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. That's on HBO right now. If you don't have HBO, you can do the seven day free trial. I would love to connect with you, uh, speak to you. Uh, you know, let me know what you think about whether it's just the documentary, this YouTube channel screening or just life in general. You know, let's connect. Let's get to know each other. And I will promise you all that if you reach out to Ernie on Twitter, <laughs> about 14 seconds will go by and you're going to get a reply. This is Ernie Stevens. He's a, I'm reading off his Twitter profile, which is more fun than anything else. Uh, e Stevens 0845 is on Twitter. Mental health advocate, criminal justice practitioner, husband, father, subject of HBO's Emmy winner, Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. Been a pleasure to have you here today, my friend. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Take care. Take care.